Good afternoon. Uh, today, I think this is the seventh of our meetings on maritime, the Maritime Transportation uh, Data Initiative. We've got a great uh, panel of uh, speakers today. Uh, uh, I also wanted to take this opportunity to, uh, uh, to recognize the 43rd uh, Commissioner of the Federal Maritime Commission, uh, Commissioner Max Vekic, and he was uh, sworn in today at 11 o'clock. I think he's still in Seattle and he's in the process of transitioning in, but uh, Max, we're really uh, happy uh, to have you on board. I'm glad you could uh, participate today in the, in the meeting on, on this uh, critical uh, issue. Uh, and uh, I talked to our chairman, Dan, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, not able to make it, but he wanted to make sure that, uh, that we welcomed you. Uh, I know you've been dealing with our staff who's fantastic, uh, do a great job on on, on uh, learning the uh, teaching you the ropes and so uh, so do you want to say anything to our, our participants and to the folks uh, on the commission uh, happy to have you uh, speak uh, commissioner thanks so much for your hospitality and the welcome uh, to this organization and uh, I um, uh, when the supply chain started having issues I thought, you know, too bad, uh, too bad more people involved in operations uh, don't get involved. And I, and now I see there's a whole, uh, there are a whole bunch of people here on this list that are involved with operations. And so that's where I come from. I'm used to loading and unloading ships. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to be involved with, uh, with uh, other people that don't know how to get the job done. And uh, my mantra has been all my life, and it was given to me by my fellow workers and the predecessors was we got to move cargo. And that's, uh, that's what we're all about. And that's what we're de dependent upon to do. And so, and I, they see, uh, guess what? I'm with another group that uh, the mantra probably is we got to move cargo. So <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Happy to be aboard. Well, we're, we're really uh, pleased to have you on board with it's a uh, little bittersweet because we uh, lost our, our friend, uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Corey, who's uh, been great. Uh, we really have a good uh, work uh, environment here. Uh, I think we, you'll you'll really enjoy it, and so we are looking forward to having you uh, with us. So, uh, uh, anyways, uh, uh, we've uh, we've got a, a great uh, panel here today. We're trying to plow through uh, the Maritime Transportation uh, Data Initiative to really uh, ascertain what the industry needs. Uh, what sort of information they need to do their job better uh, to uh, both in terms of, uh, of what they need from other aspects of the transportation uh, chain uh, and what information they, they also uh, can, can input into the system to make things uh, work. Um, uh, participants have been forwarded questions, uh, so we'll jump right into the questions. Uh, and we uh, have their bios, which are, are, are circulated, saving us time for introductions. These meetings are being recorded uh, and will be posted on the FMC YouTube page and uh, on the Maritime Transportation Data Initiative web page. Please, if one of the participants chooses to share something, use the share fun function for the public to be able to review. I wanna point out that this is a live public meeting. Only participants will be able to speak. Well, we, we will be posting the meeting on the MTDI webpage for public access. However, we welcome, and in fact, uh, we'd like to see more uh, public input, and you can email us your feedback, uh, feedback on data gaps and data needs at maritimedata at fmc.gov. That's maritimedata, all one word, at fmc.gov. Should you choose to submit public feedback, please reference whether it is in reference to an individual meeting um, or whether it is a general comment. Also, we will be posting submitted materials and comments on our webpage. We cannot post PowerPoint, so we ask that the material be submitted in Word or PDF format. Please do not include any personal identifiable information, PII, on any submission to the FMC. We're continuing these meetings uh, every Tuesday at 3 p.m. leading up to our FMC uh, Transportation Data Initiative uh, Summit. We'll probably be reaching uh, back out to uh, some of the participants as we go through the process to, to make sure we've, we've uh, summarized uh, your positions uh, accurately. Uh, last, meet, uh, last meeting was with our federal partners. Uh, we are working with the administration on this. 
they're following this closely with a uh, maritime administration, DOT, uh, customs, uh, CBP, uh, all of the other uh, federal partners, uh, Coast Guard. Um, and uh, that's uh, available at the, at the FMC YouTube uh, channel on our, on our webpage. Um, as I said, this is our seventh meeting, so we're making some progress. Uh, and uh, uh, today we have a, a selection of uh, uh, luminaries and the freight forwarding and ocean transportation intermediary uh, industry. Uh, providing their perspectives on uh, the information uh, data that we're looking uh, for. And uh, I, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, I know uh, we're uh, encroaching on time that could be spent uh, doing business and moving freight as, uh, as Commissioner Vagic uh, pointed out, but I think uh, long-term there's some value in, in trying, to, try, trying to create a better system for the movement of cargo. Uh, we've got four participants today. We've got Butch Connor, Vice President John S. Connor, Incorporated from nearby in Baltimore. Um, and uh, Michelle uh, Fiardo, is that correct, uh, Michelle? Fajardo. Um, Fajardo, <laughs> okay. Fajardo uh, from uh, President Cargo International Consolidators from Miami. Um, Terry uh, Moretti, uh, Chief Information Officer Mallory Alexander from Memphis. Uh, I think sometimes we don't. Uh, uh, get our interior partners who are engaged in freight movement uh, 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 time to, to discuss the issues, but they're all part of the chain. Uh, and Alan Baer, uh, who I spent a lot of time with talking about shipping issues, uh, 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 President OL USA LLC, uh, New York, uh, New Jersey. Earlier in the, uh, before everyone came on, he had uh, palm trees and I thought, uh, I think he felt bad about that since we were all suffering cold weather. So. Uh, Took it off. Uh, but anyways, uh, I'm going to start off with Butch. Um, uh, I know, you know, these uh, meetings uh, can, can, uh, can, because you have maybe similar points of view, don't worry about that. It helps us to get uh, points uh, emphasized. Uh, so uh, feel free to, uh, to uh, submit your comments and, and uh, reference the comments that others have made where you agree and disagree. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Butch and uh, go ahead. Uh, what I'll do is we'll go through each one in turn. I may have a question uh, after the conclusion of your remarks. Tell us when you're when you're you feel you've uh, run up uh, run out of time, and uh, uh, and then and then we'll go to the next one, um, and uh, uh, and then we'll take some general questions uh, uh, after that. So, Butch, go on. Okay, thank you. Uh, very much, Commissioner. I appreciate the time and uh, also the FMC for giving us the opportunity today. Um, the first question was, what are the key data elements uh, involved in operations? And, you know, we are always um, trying to track uh, various milestones um, uh, within our operations. And they would be, you know, most of what would be expected. Um, your, your ETD, your ETA, um, making sure you have um, all the vessel details, um, BL numbers, container numbers, um, especially uh, inbound, also the IT number becomes uh, an important factor. Um, always looking for uh, line release, looking for cargo, I mean, customs release, um, along with um, also various ETAs, if it's, if it's an IPI and you're, you're always gonna be tracking uh, when it's gonna get to the ramp uh, is important. Um, one thing that's really been a struggle uh, lately is been getting the last free day. Um, there are a number of carriers who uh, have been struggling, I think either um, having that data and also making it accessible uh, to us. So that's been a real difficulty. Um, and then also we're, we're certainly tracking uh, gate out um, and uh, making sure we understand about the empty return date uh, that's available. Um, so those, those are the key elements um, initially at this point that, that operations is normally tracking. Um, the other question that we had uh, was on the export side. So very similar. Uh, in many ways about the uh, data element. So uh, as we mentioned, um, the, the booking number uh, is a key element, of course, on the outbound side specifically, um, as well as some of the others that we had mentioned, uh, ETD, ETA, 
Um, the ERD is, is very important. We have been seeing a lot of issues uh, around the ERD, a lot having to do with the lack of schedule integrity that is going on and um, how the carriers are, are they a, a, appropriately monitoring the changes in the ERD uh, from what the initial may have been to when the cargo actually gets on to a particular vessel. That's created a lot of headaches. Um, and, you know, container number, of course, and um, seal numbers that we're looking for, weights, um, documentation, cutoff, uh, cargo cutoff dates, all important. And uh, for the freight forwarder on their side, the um, EEI, so the electronic export information uh, filing the AES uh, to make sure that's done um, within the compliant timeframes. Um, did you want me to go through all of the three questions at this point? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, we've got time and it's four of you, so go ahead and get your observations of what we want to hear. So, yep. Okay. Um, and the, the last item was about what are we missing um, and what could improve in, in reference to helping with our performance. To, to us, um, what we have seen over the years really gets down to several points and it's all about consistency of data, accuracy of data, timeliness and available data. Um, so you, you see a lot of differences across the board, whether you're dealing with carriers, you're dealing with various terminals, um, CFSs. So all of those uh, present their own difficulties and struggles uh, in trying to get the data, the, the accurate data elements we've been discussing. Um, so, you know, the, uh, as I mentioned, the last free day is, is, a, is a key element um, because that starts to becoming getting involved with, as we all love to talk about, our, our demerge issues and uh, then potentially a detention as well. So that's been a struggle. It's not consistent at all um, where you can find that data, where you can access it, um, and if it's visible to you and, and you're getting information from various carriers and other parties in, in different formats. Some it's email, some they expect you to go online. Uh, and, and unfortunately, a lot of times today, we're, we're still having to make phone calls and, uh, and, and sit on uh, the phone for, for much too long in order to just get some simple data elements uh, that we need, our customers need to keep the freight moving. Um, so you know, we find that is, is a, um, a real issue right now. Um, um, if we could get, uh, the empty return date consistently and have that advised to us. Equipment availability uh, is, a, is another point that would be very useful um, for us. Um, and with the issues around the congestion, we're finding difficulties with these um, pop-up container yards. Uh, yes, uh, I think they're, they're needed due to the fact that they've got to clear these containers uh, off the terminal in order to keep freight moving, but it's difficult, if, if at all, able to get any data uh, from those various sites. So that's uh, another area that is we find very difficult. Um, you know, one area that we have uh, long struggled with is about um, standardization of uh, free days. Um, and how we have differences between uh, the carriers and between the terminals. Um, and you know, that becomes a real struggle. Again, it kind of all gets back to consistency of data um, and making it available, accurate, and timely. Um, so besides the, the free days, and you also get into what are your uh, demerge uh, rules, right? And, and how that can also um, be very inconsistent um, from carrier to carrier as well as uh, different operations. So um, that that is kind of wraps up what I'd like to, to, to point at this time. Uh, that's great, Butch. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, one question of everyone. 
um, uh, as, before we go on to the general uh, questions, but since this congestion has uh, has occurred, and I know you're you're in Baltimore, but uh, uh, which is probably better than a lot of the other uh, areas. But uh, how much more time do your personnel require to handle the same volume of uh, of uh, uh, of cargo? Uh, in addition to their, uh, what would be baseline normal operating uh, requirements. And I will tell you, I was in St. Louis with uh, export brokers of soybeans uh, who were indicating that they were spending three times more uh, to keep up with their each individual shipment. So it was really, it was becoming a problem in terms of staffing. So I want your uh, perspective on what the congestion has meant on productivity and, and your personnel. Yeah, I certainly agree with that, uh, Commissioner, that um, I would say three times the amount of work is about right. Um, our, our teams are having to consistently go back and retouch and retouch and retouch um, um, their, their shipments, and it, uh, it's, it's very difficult. Um, so trying to make sure we're, we're tracking um, both on the inbound and the outbound side, all these changes that are coming about. Um, with um, with load dates, with discharge dates, um, with the changes in schedules, you know, there's just so much repetitive touch um, that that it is um, productivity is not where it needs to be. That's a lot. That's a lot. Three times, um, Michelle. Uh, why don't you tell us what's going on in Miami with with respect to uh, to cargo movements there? Well, first of all, uh, congratulations, um, Commissioner Beckage. We're really happy to have you on. And thank you, Commissioner Bensel, for um, you know putting this together, um, for your involvement in this. It's really important to us. Before we came on this call, I think a couple of us vented with the same problems. So um, I, I'm really happy that you included OTIs. You know, I, and VOCCs and freight forwarders were the travel agents for cargo. And we assist our clients in finding data information for them. Where are their containers? What are the best rates? So um, I think if anything, we're, the, we're detectives constantly trying to find information for our clients. And so um, I think this data initiative is amazing. Um, let me get to the questions then. Uh, all right. Um, what data, key data elements are integral to my operations? Well, um, I, my clients need the best market, the best rates in the market, and they need um, time frames that suit their needs. So many times I find myself jumping from line to line, going on to um, different websites, trying to get rates, calling, even many times calling the agents in the destination port, because I export uh, most of my cargo's export, to find who calls that port, who has the best rates, who has the best service. Um, there's, you mentioned last week, Commissioner, about Expedia, how you can go to a board in the airport and you can see all the different, you know, airlines, where they're going, if they're delayed, um, you know, and that, that's on my wish list. I wish that we can go on to some site and be able to pull all that information in real time, because yes, we can, we have to kind of juggle and see and find that information, but it takes a lot of detective work. Um, the trade lanes are constantly changing. They're not calling certain lanes anymore. And so we're challenged with finding information and accurate market rates for our clients. Um, also, where the containers are located. I know Butch was mentioning, where are these containers? Uh, many, uh, it, it's many times where I have a full staff on board to load 10 containers and they don't show up till the end of the day. You call the lines, we're making phone calls still, yes. You call the lines, you call dispatch, it's on its way and 9 a.m. doesn't show up till 5 p.m., then I'm into overtime. And that happens with many of the warehouses that I book, you know, um, that I book with and they're waiting, they have staff hold waiting to load containers and just the, the container doesn't show up, it's delayed for hours and that's just not, it, it's very inefficient. It will be nice to be able to have real-time information as to where this container is so that you can accurately plan your loads and, and get these um, imports off, the import containers offloaded, these export containers loaded. And, and so we're very challenged with acquiring that information, whether it's owner operators, whether it's uh, intermodal uh, by the lines, it's just very difficult to access that information. 
Um, we're making phone calls. We're still in a time where you can track your dinner, like we were I was mentioning before, from the restaurant down to your house where you sign for it. Um, we're still unable to track where a container is uh, coming into my warehouse or going to the port. It hasn't been checked in. Has it been manifested? Uh, is it clean on board? We have no idea. So trans and also transship and information. One of um, another porter I was speaking to was telling me that. She has an import from China, from India, for example, that has six transshipments. She has to each transshipment call and see where if it made the other vessel, if it made the other vessel. It's constant detective work to have that information available to the client because they're waiting, you know, for these materials or for this cargo. Um, uh, what is what's most integral to my to the export? Well, again, cost effective export options for my client is very important for me to find. And, and finding it quickly because they need to quote, they have their own needs and I can't sit on information. I have to be able to find it quickly for my client. And then also um, export regulatory requirements. I, I have many US PPIs that aren't aware of regulatory requirements. I guess in a world that they, that my DF PPIs, the, I export mostly, um, find these sources um, to locate their, their goods, they, these, they're not familiar with exports. So be able to supply this, these regulatory requirements for the, the US PPIs, letting them know that the export doesn't end when it gets to my warehouse or when they load that container. They're still, they're still you know, um, very much involved in supplying information to me so that we can meet these requirements. And then also the FPPI, um, you know, they're not interested in our US regulatory requirements. They're making sure that their import at destination is, is accurately done. So um, I, I need to make sure that I can also um, supply that information and let them know that you know, there are US export requirements and their export's not gonna happen until these are met by their supplier. So that's, that's data that I need to um, give them and, and make sure that they're aware of that. Uh, there's just a misconception um, by suppliers that don't have export experience that they're, they're done when, you know, when it's delivered to the forwarder or they're done when they load that container. So um, I think awareness in that they have responsibilities in that export is very important. Um, what, would, what data do we not currently have that would improve efficiency and performance? Uh, well, easy and accurate uh, container location. Um, that, wish list again, GPS every container. <laughs> I would love that. Um, is the vessel really arriving at the date listed on its on the website? I think Butch mentioned, is it accurate? You know, where can we source accurate information for when it's coming in so we can plan these imports and these exports accurately? Um, if there's a driver delay, inform us um, real time. Like FedEx sends me a, a, if they're having inclement weather, I'll get an email from FedEx. We have uh, your package may be delayed due to inclement weather. Steamship lines do not offer that information many a time. We have to be, you know, doing detective work looking for that. And finally, I think rates, uh, you know, being having access to different op shipping options, rate options. Um, you know, again, I, if I want to go and I want to travel on a personal basis, I can go on Expedia and have all my options available to me and all the different rates. Um, you know, where is their portal? And maybe the 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 market will determine this, but I wish that the maritime industry would have something like that so that we can give easier information to, you know, and fast information to our clients. Um, they're bidding projects, they're, they're trying to get their own needs met. And, and so that's important for us to be able to get that information to them. Um, and so I think that's um, pretty much um, my uh, synopsis of what challenges we have. I think they kind of are similar to what Butch has said, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you know the rest of the participants have to say. Well, thanks. That was a, a great, very good job. Uh, um, and you're right. Uh, you know, I order a Domino's pizza, and I can know when it goes in the oven. I can know when it's uh, out for delivery. I can know everything about it all the way along the the, the chain of custody till it gets to my door when they notify me that it's at the door on the doorstep and uh, this is a $10 uh, selection of uh, pizza. Uh, and we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of cargo and uh, the data gaps that we have are just sort of stunning when you consider 
what's at stake. But I'd ask you the same question I asked, uh, I asked uh, uh, Butch, uh, which is what has this meant to you in terms of productivity, your work uh, product versus what you, uh, how much more time are you spending doing detective work as you uh, uh, claim it than actually moving uh, cargo uh, uh, since the pandemic and congestion issues have come up? Well, well my, my clients have specific time frames in which they're bidding for product and, and bidding for jobs. So um, many a time that I see that I am delayed in supplying information to them or rates change quickly. Uh, so I am scrambling to, to get them that information, going on to website to website, trying to find out, calling, um, calling the destination um, agents, uh, trying to get all that accurate information, putting it together. So it's very challenging because there's there's different sources and then which source is accurate, like Butch has said. And secondly, specifically my warehouse, we load um, uh, maybe 20, 30 containers at, at one time. And, and I have a staff on online and actually with a labor shortage, it's even more challenging because I really need to plan these loads out and when these containers are not arriving, when the um, we're trying to call dispatch, they're not giving us accurate information. Uh, they're telling us it was dispatched, it's not. And then they all show up 20 containers at, at 5 p.m. I'm into overtime or my guys are just not gonna leave. They've been sitting around for 10 hours. So that's very inefficient and just really halts productivity. Uh, Terry, tell us about what's going on in uh, Memphis. I know you have some rail issues and uh, Cassie issues uh, in, in Memphis, but why don't you tell us uh, uh, what the situation is in your neck of the woods? All right, thank you, Commissioner, for a chance to uh, to share, as you said, sort of the inland look at it. But honestly, we, we're headquartered here with Mallory in Memphis, but we have operational offices scattered all over the country as well as in overseas in China and Hong Kong. So we uh, we take it all in from it at different directions. Um, just kind of looking at the questions uh, and a lot of what has been shared is uh, going to be very similar as you mentioned. From, a, from what are the key data elements, we look at information uh, this sort in three different categories. Starts with the booking information, uh, then moves on to shipment details, such as bill lading, vessel detail, uh, weights and measures for containers, et cetera. And then finally tracking related updates and events and milestones that are coming on there. Those three categories, um, we, we essentially want to source them from the same location, but ends up being that we can't do that. Uh, so we're collecting information from different places. The booking information, Vessel voyage, load, discharge ports, ETD and ETA. We're sort of counting on that coming out of vessel schedules uh, and related uh, information from the steamship lines uh, and then passing on what we need from our customer uh, to marry together with their vessel schedule information to create a booking. Shipment details are more of what we keep internally, but bill of lading uh, related, what's in the container and those kind of things, that's uh, that's more coming from our customer. But we do provide that out to the steamship line and related parties so they will know what to expect and what's coming. They will need to create documents, et cetera, like that. Tracking updates, this is where, and we, we, you know, we hear that a, as a common theme for all of us, tracking updates are the things that we, we live by and that we, we expect to be able to get and have, and that would be uh, essential information such as the ETD and ETA changes that happen out there and they're gonna happen uh, and consistency with those container events are, are critical. Uh, we all look for basically the same set of events for each container that, that's aboard the vessel for our particular booking. Um, and we're, so we're tracking them separately but but also as a group and trying to get those in, that information back um, what i refer to as routing information you know we might get a load port and a discharge port in the initial booking but lo and behold the vessels calling other ports and sometimes transshipment ports that we're not even aware of 
uh, it's not identified in the booking initially, or because of one thing or another, the steamship line has decided to, uh, to take the vessel into a different port than was identified. So getting that information to us uh, gives us the ability to one, manage the booking on behalf of our customer, but also to give them that sort of uh, proactive information they're looking for to do things like uh, planning for labor in their warehouses, as well as uh, when to give expectation to their customers about arriving cargo, uh, kind of in this just-in-time world that we see ourselves in, in the ocean industry out here. Um, we are a uh, we are a, uh, a company that handles both import and export operations. Um, you know, on any given day, it might be 50-50. It might sway one way or the other. Uh, we do a lot on the export side with the agricultural and forestry related products. Um, cotton is a is a major commodity for us for export, as well as paper and cellulose fiber are major export products for us. And so when we look at an export, there's slight variations in critical, what's critical information for our customers. Um, one of the things that's always important for, a, uh, for an export customer is gonna be things like vessel and port cutoffs, the documentation cutoffs or what we call dock cuts that are related out there. They, um, you know, we mentioned before, when depending on the steamship line, depending on the port, there's not really consistent. Sometimes you, you know, you have a, you know, you have a noon on Saturday cut off for a vessel departing on Monday, but sometimes it's different. It could be noon on Friday. Uh, it's just real inconsistent in that area, but those are critical on the booking side. Um, we have a high level of interest in the, uh, on the export side with data going into the master bill. For us, we, uh, we have a lot of customers to do letter of credit shipments. So content has to be accurate and consistent in the master bill uh, in order for our customer to get paid, who's the exporter. And so we, we spend a lot of time there and there's a lot of just uh, amazing amount of, of uh, errors and, and uh, discrepancies from what we send. And we send most of this information electronically to the line. And somehow when we get the first proof back, it's not even, it's not even close sometimes. <laughs> um, and it's a curiosity because we, we, we have a lot of carriers. We cover a lot of ground. We do both BCO and NVO exports. And it, it really doesn't matter honestly, who you are as far as uh, to the, the client, you might be a VIP to this line or, um, or you might be one of their largest exporters in the country. And you still get to basically a lot of the similar kind of discrepancies and inaccuracies in the data. On the tracking side, it, it's kind of curious on the export side, a lot of our customers are, when it, we get a confirmed on board, they're done. They're not, you know, they're going to get paid because it, it got aboard and they're, they're happy and they're not looking for anything else. Uh, but generally across the board, as a, uh, as a courtesy to our customers, we're providing them what we get as far as tracking information to that, that customer. Before the vessel leaves, their high interest is ETD, or I mean ETD changes because they happen so often. Um, We've seen ETD changes on the same voyage, the same vessel voyage booking uh, three to six times in one day. And it goes from, you know, leaving on the, you know, two days later to leaving a day earlier than it was expected. And these happen regularly. We've, we kind of have a, a kind of a scoreboard out there. And I think our highest level has been 23 changes to ETD on an export vessel leaving out of Long Beach. So. We had a lot of, you know, the, so those are the, the, what's the key elements for our customers there. There's a lot more because we do uh, customs brokerage as well. And so there's a lot of detail in there that's associated with getting the, getting customs uh, information filed accurately and timely is to ensure everything that is supposed to happen happens 
from a regulatory perspective. And from the import side, that there's a lot of discrepancies that we have to deal with uh, to ensure uh, the cargo is clear timely so there's no holdup at the port. Um, what, what do we uh, currently have access to or not have access to? Uh, we can typically we can typically find all the information, but just as others have shared, it's it's a matter of timeliness of the data to start with. It's a matter. The second uh, area is that data quality or data accuracy. Uh, and the, those two areas alone prevent us from getting uh, the quality of information we need to take care of our customer in a timely manner, uh, to ensure that their cargo is not held at the port, to ensure that a container does not sit in the yard and go uh, past the free day, as, as was mentioned. Um, we also run into, because we have a lot of imports that come in and, and get on the rail, we run into uh, to issues at the ramps uh, where a container, for instance, is put into constructive placement, but it's backed up in the yard. And so there's no way to get it out. Uh, even if you have a truck go over to pick it up, it's behind a hundred other containers. And then next thing you know, you're hit with a storage charge or a demurrage charge and you had nothing to do with it. And nobody told you about it. Uh, until you start doing that forensic uh, research that we do trying to deal with charges that are coming down the pipeline. Another uh, area in that is we, we attempt and we are highly integrated with a lot of the steamship lines through either direct with the steamship line or through ocean portals uh, like Intra or, uh, or Nexus or uh, Cargo Smart. Uh, and the... Uh, one of the things that is a challenge for us is the EDI comes in and provides us certain information. And then uh, our customer might go to the carrier's website and see a totally different uh, detail of information there than what we've uh, just received via EDI and sent to them. So there's conflicts even within the same uh, steamship line with what comes out via electronic uh, posting uh, via EDI as opposed to what they're actually recording on their websites. Um, timeliness on the export side is is probably seen more often than than import. I think, at least from our, uh, my opinion on this, is because we will uh, we will not get, for example, a vessel or get a uh, container loaded on board message for containers loading on an export vessel typically until the vessel departs. So it, we, it's, it's a day or two out of port. And next thing you know, we get a flood of, of vessel or container loaded on board messages uh, in from the steamship lines. It's, a, it's, it's just strange how that happens. We don't see that same behavior, for example, on origin side on an import shipment and potentially using the same steamship line. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a curiosity. One of the other challenges also to this uh, access to data is the multitude of sources. You really, uh, and, and the detective work that was shared uh, talking about that as a detective is exactly what it is because we all know, and these guys that are sitting at these desks working these loads, they know there's, a, there's three different places they can go to try to find this data. If they can't get it from one, they'll try a different source. Uh, it's always a curiosity to me how many times they can go to different places to find different information. And so we, we find ourselves struck in the middle between data quality issues on who do you believe? You get it from the port that the container's actually all uh, been gated in, but we've not seen a message from the steamship line that it was gated in. So we yeah, it's multitude of sources and then who do you believe? Who do you, you use? Who do you rely on to get the information? Um, and then, the, you know, in that same area, when the steamship lines and the railroads are working together, um, many times we see discrepancies even between them in the sense that uh, the rail yard may say the container is there and the steamship line says it hasn't gated out yet. Um, and it, so it's, again, that even when the two partners are working together, they can't get the story straight. 
So that's sort of a high level for, for us. That's what we're seeing at least on topic one, Commissioner. So. Thanks, Terry. That was great. Uh, I, I do think we, we need to, to look closely, not only at what sort of information is provided, but also who's in the best position to provide the information. Uh, you know, is it the MTO, uh, the terminal itself, or is it the carrier? Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it's usually the one that's operationally in control of the cargo at the time uh, that, that should be uh, doing the reporting, in my view, because uh, uh, that should be real time, at least with their own operational stuff. And, and there can be lags in reporting, but we do need to look at that. Um, again, with the other uh, with, uh, uh, participants, uh, uh, what do you think this uh, uh, delay congestion has created in terms of your workforce? I know it's different, difficult because you've got branches throughout, but what do you, uh, are you seeing uh, it take twice as long to do the detective work and to verify and check or, or three times as, as, as long? Uh, what's, what's going on with your personnel? Well, yeah, and the, you know, it's two to three times is, a, is an easy estimate of what it is. You know, the, it, it's kind of unfortunate and then fortunate, I guess, at the same time, depending on who you are and looking at it. You know, with, with the, the issue with COVID and all of this remote work that was put out and a lot of companies like ourselves that had to respond by sending folks home, working from home, unfortunately, you, you end up with people who work longer hours simply because they didn't have to drive to work. Uh, and and come into the office. Unfortunately for them, they they're working ten and twelve hour days instead of, you know, an eight or a nine hour day, whatever it was that they were working before. And and the burnout is huge for these guys because they are working so long out there. This labor shortage that Michelle mentioned has hit us all pretty hard. So it, it's a it's a combination of guys working longer plus we're having to grow our staff just to cover what we did before uh we're growing our staff and the volumes haven't changed that much we just simply need more people to cover the same loads yeah they, sometimes we don't quantify that in the forwarding industry what it means to their own workforces in terms of productivity and what it means on employment and so we need to think about that a little bit more because uh, you got to get the documentation to get the cargo moving so yes sir alan uh alan bear uh you we've had discussions before about shipping issues and uh always respect your views so go ahead and, and take your shot thank you commissioner uh i'll start sort of with the last question first uh, we would agree that it's definitely uh when we look at it about three times as much work today and a lot of that's driven uh, on the export side for us by the ERD, that the constant changes and the amount of cost that's now incurred by um, shippers here in, in America, uh, you pick up containers, you can't bring them back. You have to store them over the weekend. They're fully loaded. You have to sometimes take them back to the warehouse and unload them because the ERD just went back 10 days and you can't keep a box out for 10 days on detention. That's a massive amount of work, and there is not a consistent channel to get that information. Uh, some of the carriers will tell you, check with them. Some will tell you, you got to go to the terminal. Then the terminals don't have consistent data. You look at the structure out in LA where some of it's basically leased terminal operations. So they all don't keep the same data elements published on each of the terminals in LA Long Beach. That's one of the places I think we could make a lot of headway as an industry. Um, whether we have continued port delays or not, just some common funnel of, of that data would be a big help. Um, it, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars that we see on our books of, of ERD changes and delays that, that exporters are incurring, um, whether it's extra trucking to merge, as I said. Same thing on the LRD. Uh, that that swings uh, to Terry's uh, comment where they had on their board 23 changes. Um, it's all too common. We had one exporter uh, going to Australia. They brought in a flat rack um, and there was a fumigation window. The ship fell a week. They actually had to pick it up, take it out. Then they fumigated it again, brought it back in in the, in the open window. The vessel fell again. They had to pick it up and take it out another time. 
those costs are massive for, for the industry overall right now. Uh, 315 events, uh, as everybody's talking about the hunt for data, there's no consistency uh, yet. You can get 90% of an EDI message, as Terry was saying, on vessel departure uh, or vessel arrival. But as it goes down the, the chain of events, empty out, empty in, transshipment, relay, arrival overseas, did the container go out gate or is it still stuck on the dock in Sydney or not? Um, that kind of data, we've seen 90% on some all the way down to 10% or non-existent on others. Uh, that would be a big help uh, if we saw more consistency there. Um, exporters are also hit by the lack of coordination uh, not all of the data makes it to the booking uh, depot inland or the terminal operator. So you have truckers showing up with a booking number that the carriers provided and the, the depot doesn't have the booking number on file. The trucker now sits there, has to get out of line. It's two hours of waiting time. You have to wait for the carrier to transmit it. All of those things are impacting the the real flow uh, of cargo and, and running up our exporters costs uh, in, in the sense of what we could address there. Uh, the, the second part there was what data don't we have enough access to? Again, it, it, for us at least, where we see endless reworking of files is on that ERD. Um, it, if you go back to 2019, pre-COVID, you got a date, the ship's more or less held it, you handled the file once. Um, and as everybody's mentioned, you have now added a second and third person on a desk uh, that was a one person desk in order to go through and, and play detective and, and rework file after file. Uh, there's no, no doubt about that. Uh, some solutions uh, to your second question, what elements are we getting? We're using uh, EDI, 315s, uh, we have APIs, although the carriers are not um, as technological forward in coming forward with APIs to help us query um, more electronically. Uh, we've also developed some robots in the background to actually try to sniff out the ERD changes. So we are pinging carrier terminals to try to get those dates in the middle of the night uh, because there's also no standardization of when they change the time. So a carrier at five o'clock could suddenly delay a ship. Uh, on a Thursday at five o'clock, you were supposed to deliver Friday, you picked it up. And then finally they tell you, no, it's now Tuesday. Um, some terminals change it in the middle of the night. And if, if you don't check the terminal at 8 a.m. the next morning, your truckers are already online to get an empty container. And then they say, oh, we were turned away. Well, there's an extra $400 of dead time. And it, that cash register just keeps going uh, uh, on that kind of stuff the billing disputes that arise out of that. And then the, the enormous toll it takes on your accounting team and your ops team who have to stop and look at a bill. Oh, was it really three days? Did the chassis go? All of those embedded costs have added hundreds, if not millions of dollars to the export supply chain right now. Uh, that, that could really be uh, improved if we came up with um, some standardization of what everybody has up to whether it's on the marine terminal side or the ocean carrier side. I, I think we go a long way. And the last thing uh, to Michelle's point, uh, we've been working on an app that we're giving to truckers uh, that actually feeds through GPS where they are um, with their marine containers and you get alerts saying I'm 10 miles away, I'm 20 miles away, I'm on time, things like that that help uh, manage the flow uh, of boxes. That, that's another place to access data get container numbers and things like that. Uh, um, I'm just aware of the time and trying to squeeze in some questions for you before you get to the hours. So I apologize for going so quickly there, but uh, for us, just on a pure export basis, I mean, we do both and we're a 50-50 company, but owing to trying to get more exports out of the US, we would love some standardized uh, process around the ERD. Um, coming out of all the hearings that you're holding with, with all of the stakeholders. Can I squeeze in one question here? This is uh, John. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, this is for everybody. I mean, really, how are you communicating your data with your customers? You know, is it email, phone call, smoke signal? What, how, what's the, how are you communicating what you have? What information well, but, you have? 
from our side, we, we publish reports every day of the week, depending on what the customer wants. So some want a 27 column report and some people just want a three column. The other are alerts. So we have built now a notification that if, if our robot has found the delay in the ERD, we publish that immediately out in an alert to the trucker, to the shipper or our customer, or a forwarder who may be giving us business, uh, our overseas agent. Uh, and then the desktop ops person is instantly getting it that the ERD has changed by how many days. So it's a lot of that is done electronically uh, through emails uh, and updates like that. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah I would just like to uh, add that they're quite similar um, to what Alan was mentioning. And we, uh, our transportation management system does a lot of collection of the data from uh, various uh, suppliers of the data, and we get that out to our customers. Uh, we also utilize our interface engine um, where we have some setups, whether we're, most of that is around uh, APIs um, that we're utilizing and, and trying to get them data, as, as Alan said, and getting them status updates uh, and, and those kind of things. I suspect, I suspect all of us kind of have similar things. One of the things we did for notifying customers was we created a, a, an application that lets them self-subscribe to the events that they're interested in getting access to so that we don't just force them. You know, it's kind of one thing, a guy walks in a new customer and says, you know, I want a notification for everything until his email box fills up with all these notifications. So we give them a tool that lets them pick and choose the kind of uh, notifications they're interested in. And that can come out to them electronically or uh, we can uh, we can send it to their to their phone or or, or whatever they're interested in, but a lot of, a lot of the big customers there are still doing the same thing we've always done for them. It's either a report, a scheduled report, or it's some sort of EDI message that uh, that we post back to them. Yeah, we have a, our software. Our clients can um, have access to their uh, software portal. They can access uh, their information there, shipment information. Um, what's coming to our warehouse for them. They can see pictures, they get EDI notifications as well. And so um, it, there's different ways of, uh, of them accessing the information from us. And something else I wanted to mention is that our clients and, and all of us really, we've gotten used to um, technology. And when we order from Amazon or, or any of these um, any of these places, we have real-time information when something shipped, when something's on its way, when it's arriving, when it's delayed. And um, the technology is there. So uh, I'm really happy that this initiative is happening because I don't see why um, our, you know, the, the trade industry cannot implement it and, and find a, and find a uni unified source for all of this information so that the trade can flow easily. So, so I, I did want to thank you for, for that. I, I, I agree we can use technology here. And I think if we can come up with the standard way, form and content, who should be providing information, uh, the industry can come up with some ideas themselves on how to, to do that in a way that's, that's efficient. Uh, uh, and you can all do your own thing, uh, but uh, we all need to have the same standards at the end of the day. So when the information should be provided, when, 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 it's, uh, when it's accessible and, and who should provide it. Uh, but uh, uh, Terry, you were mentioning um, a, a lot of these uh, data issues related to, it sounded as if they're taking uh, cargo uh, data and entering it in physically, and there's just discrepancies all the way through the process. Is that is that what you're saying? That how much of this is paper work that people are are filling in now, as opposed to just uh, you know being able to transfer it directly to uh, to an input? Well, we we try to, especially from the from the tracking side, we we rely on that electronic integration with these carriers out here. The problem we have is the is the efficiency of it or the accuracy of it all of a sudden creates problems for example in kind of looking at this meeting here i looked at our top 25 carriers out there on the scorecard and they're averaging only about 56 percent of the events we expect to get are coming in and that's 
And that, you know, that's the top 10 of everybody's top 10 out there at least, you know, so it's not like these are little guys that are doing this. These are guys that have done this for years and, and the information is so haphazard. Sometimes it's just amazing. We, but what we have to do commissioner is if it doesn't come in electronically, it doesn't eliminate us needing to give it to our customer. And then the detectives come in and start chasing down that, you know, two out of 10 containers. Why did those two not load? You know, one of the things that's been such a uh, kind of a big change is the number of transshipments that are interceding now in the middle of these loads where we might not have seen them so much in the past. And if you compare the event structure from a standard, you know, export, which is, or the parts out of Long Beach ends up in Shanghai, we got pretty good accuracy there. But when we look at what's going on with transshipments, we're in the 40% of that. It's, yeah. it's almost like it's unknown to even the steamship line that it showed up at a transshipment port. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I will tell you, in uh, the Port of Houston is restricting access into their port complex of larger ships. And so a lot of stuff is being transshipped in the Gulf of Mexico because they're not allowing Neopanamax vessels through the Houston ship channel. And yes, uh, Texas is not open for business. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, they're working on that. I've been talking to the port, but, but so with respect to the trucking issue, I think Michelle and Alan both talked about, this seems to me a big gap uh, area um, and one that's increasingly challenging. Uh, uh, any thoughts? I mean, I mean, we probably have to deal with every port on a port by port basis, but is there ways so that you're, you're gonna know that you can get uh, equipment uh, to the places that you need to get it and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and position uh, the equipment that you need uh, to provide service uh, and probably even you know, accessibility of grades, truck, truck drivers and, and, and companies. What, what is the status there? I'll tell you uh, to jump in. Oh, I, I wasn't sure. No, go ahead. Um, go ahead I think that that was a point also. Uh, there is no coordinated um, container availability portal, even with the carriers. So you can sometimes make a booking out of Columbus, Ohio, and you're told there's equipment and you show up three days from now and there's no equipment. So that would be something to cover. Uh, I, from a model standpoint, I think the, and not to give them a commercial or whatever, um, and I'm sorry, Butch, but the port of Norfolk and Virginia or the Virginia terminals happen to run a, a decent visibility product, at least from our standpoint that we're finding that we're able to get a lot of information there. Uh, I, I think that from your chair, it'll be, it's hard because you've got differing profit incentives from different operators. They're all not state run terminals. There are some private terminal operators. They all run different softwares. Um, but as much as we were able to in somewhat build around the success of an intra uh, type of format, there may be something like that, that they all feed data into that the industry at large can plug into. Um, and almost like a splitter on a cable TV line uh, where you have one in and two out, it could be that all the terminals have to plug into fmc.equipment and out of the back of that, we all plug in and get data out of the, There may be some initiatives like that, that that may carry the day. A non-technical approach commissioner is a lot of export shippers, especially the very big ones, are kind of negotiating with Drayman to bring empties back to their warehouse, for example, and put it on the yard so that they've got an empty waiting for them when they need it. It's been an interesting to watch some of that. These big guys are not getting the, they're not turning the containers back in. They're getting these guys to bring them over and put them on the yard. And they're sitting there on the chassis waiting to be loaded. And that's the only way they're having consistent boxes when they're ready to export. Yeah, there's a lot of chassis hoarding going on. Michelle, did you wanna? Yeah, I'm just curious about um, how other industries have been able to implement technology I, I just wonder, you know, is there, there's no incentive for the maritime industry to update their technology because, and I know that you've had, 
you know, your initiatives on, on detention and demerge, but there's just so much at stake if they cut detention and demerge. For example, if you have consistent appointment set for, for driver pickups and, and knowing that containers are available and not, if the information's there and we're more efficient, then a big chunk of income is cut for these uh, terminals and steamship lines. So I'm curious as to how we can get them, you know, yeah. in line. Yeah. You know, uh, I think they probably would do better if they could move the cargo more efficiently than the charges that they have for detention and demerge, and that stands all the way through. Uh, so efficiency and, and properly moving functions probably is better than uh, penalties and fines uh, for non-movement. Uh, and so uh, that's what we should be aiming at. And uh, so I think that that's what, what this initiative is trying to, to do is to, to create uh, an opportunity for the industry to have best practices on information. So I'd also be interested, I know you all brought up the data elements, but I would be interested in your perspectives on who should provide the, who is the best source of information for those uh, data elements. You know, my general perception is that if it's in the terminal and it's a terminal operation or status issue, it's probably the terminals uh, the, that has the best source of information in the vessel uh, maybe uh, the vessel operating uh, operator may be uh, working with the railroads and and uh, and who should provide information at various steps. So I'd be interested in your perspectives on that. We're we're we've ex exceeded our time limit, but uh, but I, but uh, but it was very interesting uh, conversation. So uh, the one the one uh, question that I wanted to ask in leaving uh, is so everybody sort of uh, sort of nodded when they, when they said we're taking two or three times more to achieve the 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 same uh, result um in terms of of moving cargo is is that is that accurate or is it, is it overstating it's accurate. It's accurate. It's accurate. It's accurate. It's accurate okay so that's why we need to uh, do something <laughs> if it takes two or three times more to do something and the cost is uh, so relatively low that Domino's can tell me exactly where my pizza is going to be. And we're not doing the same thing for hundreds of millions and billions and trillions of $1.5 trillion of containerized cargo comes in the United States and is shipped out. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, we'll be, we'll be uh, uh, back in, in contact with all of you as we go through. We're going to uh, digest what we have, but uh, I would be interested in getting um, your perspectives on uh, not only the data elements, but uh, who's in the best position to get you the data. And, and if you have any thoughts on timeliness, like if, if, if you get a call at eight o'clock at night on the availability of a intermodal rail uh, a train the next morning, you know, it, you're not going to get anybody uh, to pick up your, your uh, cargo container from the terminal. So, so, so those elements in terms of of what you think would be great uh, if you want to provide that uh, to us. Uh, otherwise, we'll probably be back in contact as we go through uh, uh, the, the uh, events that we've had so far. But it was great, uh, very uh, good uh, uh, participation today. Expertise uh, was was uh, was very helpful. And so we are going to be aiming towards a, uh, a uh, transportation data initiative in, in June this year to sort of summarize. Uh, and actually, uh, Alan, uh, uh, Commissioner Dye is working on some issues related to ERDs and that challenge and, and providing information. So she's uh, working. And so I'm going to work with her when we get uh, uh, closer to, to considering uh, carriers um, and, and their information uh, sources and, and what, what's, uh, what should be uh, uh, done in this area. So but uh, thank you all for uh, participating. It was uh, great um, uh, to talk to you all, and uh, um, we look forward to further inter interaction. And Carl, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank Take you. care.